Everybody is clamoring for budget builds these days, and usually that comes with a lot of compromises. But what if I told you that you could cram a $300 1440p capable graphics card into a $550 system? That's exactly what we're gonna do here today. Last year's award-winning PureBase 500 is back with more style, better airflow, and more features. Meet the latest stellar offering from Be Quiet, the PureBase 500 DX. Dressed in black or white, the DX introduces improved airflow through the complete mesh front panel and an eye-catching addressable RGB accent. It retains the same functional yet compact interior layout with room for up to a 360 millimeter radiator, and it does this all for under 100 bucks. To learn more, head over to BeQuiet.com or check the link below. If you are new here to the channel, first of all, welcome. Thanks for coming by and checking us out. We do this kind of PC build content every single week. And if you wanna see more of it, make sure you get subscribed and hit that notification bell. This week, we are trying to hit a crazy low price target while maintaining 1440p playability, which is not something that's gonna be easy to do. And to be honest, I'm not sure if we're even going to succeed. I have not tested this configuration in any way, but that's why I make the videos so that you guys know what's up. Now, some of the components that we have here on the table honestly made me question my choices in life a little bit because they are a little bit shady. But hopefully when it all comes together, we can deliver on the promise of that 1440p experience that we know that this graphics card can deliver. This right here is an EVGA RTX 2060 KO. This was debuted at CES this year, and although it was released a short time after that, we really haven't done very much with it on the channel. Now, it is basically just an RTX 2060, not the super version, but the 2060 is still a very capable card, able to hit that 1440p mark in a lot of gaming titles. EVGA was able to reduce the price down to $299 MSRP by kind of cutting a few corners on the cooler and making the card honestly pretty small and light. However, that doesn't necessarily take away from what it can do. And although we do need a proper supporting cast in order to enable this card to really stretch its legs, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do that today. Where I started this project was with the graphics card, and to be honest, it was not the 2060 to start. My initial thoughts on this build were, let's take a 1660 Ti and build the best system that we can around it for as inexpensively as possible. As I got to putting everything together, it kind of morphed into, let's see what kind of a budget we can attain while still keeping that 1660 Ti as our graphics card. And as I got closer and closer to that $550 mark, I said, well, I wonder what would happen if we went up to a 2060, because this one is available. It's supposed to be $300, but it's available now for about $310. And yes, you can buy this right now. When I switched over to the 2060 as our graphics card, I could really no longer hit that $500 price target. However, I was able to stay under $550, which I think is still a very reasonable price to pay for a gaming PC. Now granted, we did cut a few corners elsewhere, which you will definitely see in a minute, but we still have a very powerful GPU to base our system around. So yes, the majority of our budget is being sucked up by one component. So we had to make up for that in other places, and I started with the CPU. So this right here is AMD's Athlon 3000G. It's the lowest end processor that they make right now. And while it is not very powerful and is not gonna give you the best gaming performance, my hope is that by increasing our resolution that we're gaming at, we're gonna decrease the reliance on the CPU as a bottleneck, essentially, and kind of transfer all the heavy lifting over to our GPU. Now, fingers crossed that that works, and we'll see in the end how we end up gaming. We will be pairing our 3000G with the Asus Prime A320M-K motherboard. This, again, is a very low-end A320 board. However, Asus and a lot of other manufacturers are starting to ship these boards 
with the BIOS that supports Ryzen 3000 series. And you can tell when that is the case because they mark it as such on the box. You'll see two little stickers down below that show 2000 and 3000 compatibility. That's Ryzen 2 and Ryzen 3. This means you don't have to update the BIOS when you get it. And even though this is a first gen A320 board, it will still support the Athlon 3000G right out of the box. As a rule now, I do try to get 16 gigs of memory in every single one of the builds that I do, if not more. However, in this case, we did have to reduce it to a two by four gig kit. This is from G-Skill. It's the most basic kit that they make. As you can see, there are actually only memory modules on one side of the dim. There's no heat spreader, but at least they are painted black and as it turns out, the case that we're using does not have a side panel, so aesthetics aren't really going to matter very much for the interior of our case. And it's a two by four gig kit. It'll do fine for us for now. Now the power supply, I am not very proud of. I just bought this because I didn't have anything like it in the office. This is just an EVGA 400 watt unit. It is not 80 plus certified at all. It obviously is not modular. It doesn't have any black cabling. It's all yellow and red and on nasty colors, but it does fit within our budget and it does fit within our power requirements. So I do trust the brand EVGA and I don't think it's gonna blow anything up. I think we'll be just fine using it, but I do recommend maybe stepping up to a 450 watt unit if you could get one that's bronze rated. But this fits in our budget. And for now, this is what we're going to be using. And like I said, we are cutting some corners here. So if you wanna hit that price target like we're trying to do now, these are the kinds of things that unfortunately you generally have to do. Also, we're gonna be using a case from DIY PC. This is the MA01R. It is a micro ATX chassis, no side window. It's very light and flimsy feeling. The steel feels pretty thin, but for you optical fanboys, there is an optical drive mount up front. It has both USB 2 and USB 3. And you know what? I'm sure it'll do just fine for this build. So that is the hardware that we are working with here today. Besides the GPU, None of it is very impressive, but importantly, we stayed under budget. I went through and made sure that every single one of these items is available at retail at a price that fits our price target right now as of the filming of this video. So all the links are gonna be down below if you wanna replicate something like this. And again, I don't know exactly how it's gonna perform because I haven't tested, but we are gonna run our benchmarks at 1440p. So before we can do that, I gotta put it together. So cue that time lapse.
All right, so I won't keep you in suspense. How did we do? Is this a 1440p gaming box? Yes, we'll say yes. It is capable of that performance and I ran eight tests in order to prove this. All the tests were run at 1440p high settings, not ultra, but high, still looking pretty good. And the results that we got were decent. At the same time, I think the question has to be asked, would I recommend that somebody build this exact system? And the answer to that question is no. So let's get into a little more detail about that. So we ran eight different gaming tests. Normally I run five, I ran eight this time. I wanted to get a better feel for how this system performed. I ran four DX11, two DX12, and two Vulcan tests. I tried to mix new and old titles, and this is how we came out. The DX11 titles were Ghost Recon Wildlands, which ran somewhere in the high 40s. Uh, Far Cry New Dawn, which was running pretty well, like in the 60s, 70s, uh, as far as frame rate goes. Uh, I also took it back a little bit, ran Crisis 3. That was running really well, between 60 and 90 frames per second. And then I also ran For Honor, which is not a game that I normally test, but it was running at 100 frames per second. It's got a pretty good can benchmark. Then I swapped over to DX12, tried out Shadow of the Tomb Raider, that, depending on the scene, was running between 40 and 60 frames per second. Now, sounds kind of low, but that is a slower game, and it's, it's playable. It's still a playable experience. Deus Ex Mankind Divided was running a little better, between 60 and 70 frames per second. Then we went over to Vulcan, which is the champion API of lower-end graphics cards. Doom Eternal, I had a little issue with. I could not run it at 1440p. It was running fine at 1080p, 120 frames per second or something like that, but as soon as I flipped the switch to 1440, the entire game would just crash to desktop, and that happened every single time I tried. So I don't know what was going on with Doom Eternal, and I didn't really have a whole lot of time to troubleshoot, so uh, maybe it's a problem with the number of cores or something along those lines, but it wouldn't run. So I couldn't get you any 1440p numbers for Doom. Strange Brigade did run at 1440p, and that was around 100 frames per second. Both of those games are fairly easy to drive, and uh, I am a big fan of the Vulcan API for that reason. Now, something to note about all of these results. While the numbers, the raw frames per second numbers, look not bad, the problem lies in consistency of frame times, and we were seeing a lot of frame time spikes, and the CPU was just constantly maxed out at 100%. If you look at the top left-hand corner of the screen, you can see the CPU utilization versus the GPU utilization. Usually, when you're gaming, you see the GPU running between 90 and 100% and the CPU somewhere around 50 to 60%. This was completely the opposite. The CPU is not able to send enough draw instructions to the GPU in order to let the GPU do what it, it is capable of. So as a result, we don't have gaming uh, performance that is going to be representative of what the 2060 can actually accomplish should it be paired with a higher end CPU. But we have to look at both sides of this and this was not an exercise to see how fast we could get the RTX 2060 to run. It was to see if we could get a 1440p capable machine for $550 and I think we did that. But the reason why I say that I would not necessarily recommend that you go out and build this is because I'm not confident that the 3000G is really gonna be capable of doing anything more than this. And even maybe a year down the line, you might be really hankering for a new CPU. What I would recommend is, even though the parts list here, like I said initially, was a little bit shady, I didn't have any performance issues with the power supply, with the memory, with the motherboard, anything like that. The main issue was the CPU itself. Now, I would say that you should upgrade to something like a 1600 AF, which should be $85 and would only increase the cost of this build by 35 bucks. But right now, those are going for $150, so that kind of sucks. The next possible replacement for the 3000G would be something like a Ryzen 3 3100, and that is $105 right now on Newegg, and you can purchase it, and I think that would be a significant upgrade. 
But then again, that would take our total system cost to about $600. So I understand that people have strict budgets sometimes. And if you're like, I have $550, I cannot spend more than that. And somebody says, well, you should just spend an extra 50 bucks. That's, that kind of sucks to hear. And I'm not trying to do that to anybody. If you want a decent performing machine, this is sort of it. But I would say that instead of going out and buying it, just wait. Wait until next generation parts come. Wait until maybe the 1600 AF comes down to a reasonable price. I wouldn't necessarily put this parts list together. That being said, this performed pretty well, I think. Probably about as well as we can expect. And I am happy that we did this. You didn't see any sexy B-roll because there's really nothing to see. It's just kind of a black box. It's got a shiny front and a very weak LED fan that shows through the front in red. Other than that, it's nothing really special to look at. It's not overly loud, which is good. It's very small and light, which again is good, but it's lacking a lot of features and it is lacking obviously a little bit of performance. So that is our $550 1440p gaming machine. What do you guys think? Is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea? Are you glad I did this experiment? Because I think I am. It's good to know what exactly the limits are of certain hardware that we normally play around with here on the channel. And this was a good exercise. But like I said, don't build this, wait a little bit, save up a few more dollars, and I think you could do a lot better. Thank you so much for watching. As I said earlier, make sure you get subscribed to the channel if you wanna see more content just like this, and I will see you guys next week with another build.